The monitor round is the method by which departments can return underspends for reallocation, identify pressures and manage their budgets. It is primarily about the reallocation of money already in the system, not the announcement of new money. And with the end of the financial year fast approaching, we have a short window to spend reallocations. I have therefore moved quickly to agree this monitoring round with the executive colleagues and put the money back into the services where it can be used and where it is needed. The Assembly will have an opportunity to debate the financial position for 2019-20 more fully when I bring the Budget Bill before this House in February. All departments should engage with their committees in advance of this, and I will discuss this with the Finance Committee when I meet them on Wednesday of this week. The top-line figures are that there are 35.8 million resource Dell and 5.8 million capital Dell available for reallocation, and these funds have become available for a combination of sources. Adjustments to centrally held funds, including delivering social change, Atlantic philanthropies, tackling paramilitary activity, EU match funding and RRI interest, has resulted in 1.2 million resource Dell and 0.8 million capital Dell becoming available for reallocation. Adjustments to EU exit preparation costs have also provided additional funding for reallocation. 37.5 million was previously allocated to prepare for a no-deal exit. This funding was mainly provided as resource Dell, whereas funding required by departments to complete the work was both resource Dell and capital Dell. The outcome is an easement in resource Dell of 16.1 million, with a corresponding pressure in capital Dell of 16.1 million. We have subsequently received a further Barnet consequential on allocations of EU exit funding to Whitehall departments. This additional funding, coupled with a small amount unallocated from previous provisions, results in 2.4 million being available. While the Department for the Economy and the Department for Education registered pressures related to EU exit preparedness, totaling 2.7 million as part of this round, a no-deal exit has been averted, reducing the need for urgent funding. Consequently, the additional 2.4 million resource Dell has been made available for reallocation. Members will be aware that a commitment was previously given to provide an additional 28 million for the agreed pay settlement for health and social care staff of 3%. The further €30 million required to award this pay increase has subsequently been provided for as an advance from the financial package accompanying New Deal, New Approach. In total, these central issues resulted in an opening pressure of €8.2 million on resource Dell and €15.4 million on capital Dell. Moving on to reduced requirements, these come to €42.8 million resource Dell and €21.9 million in capital Dell. Full details are provided in the tables provided with this statement. In terms of resource Dell, the Department for Communities declared 20.3 million relating to welfare reform mitigation and 6.7 million relating to housing benefit. For welfare mitigations, this is primarily not due to a lack of uptake, but rather the fact that people have been successful in their appeals, leading to the mitigations being refunded when their benefits have been restored. The Department of Justice has declared a reduced requirement of 3 million relating to the unpredictable nature of, uh, of the timing of high value compensation payments. DERA have declared a 2.6 million reduced requirement reflecting the demand-led nature of bovine TV compensation. Reduced requirements totaling some 4.3 million have been declared by a number of departments in relation to the 37.5 million in EU exit preparation funding provided earlier this year. The fact that a no-deal exit has been avoided means that departmental requirements have reduced. On Capital Dale, the most significant reduced requirements include an eight million receipt from the Department of Education Department of Economy, sorry, relating to an additional Presbyterian Mutual Society loan repayment. The administrators of the Presbyterian Mutual Society loan book continue to make good progress in disposal of the assets in line with forecasts. The Finance Department has experienced delays in a number of capital projects, including agile working. And finally, DERA have reduced two point seven million related to slippage on waste management programmes. Mr Speaker, departments have some scope to reallocate resources internally. Movements of money across spending areas in excess of one million are subject to the executive's approval. In some instances, departments also seek permission to move allocations across spending areas to facilitate a transfer of responsibility from a particular function from one business to the other. The internal reallocations agreed by the executive in this monitoring round are also included in the tables for information. Departments may also, for a number of reasons, seek to reclassify expenditure from resource to capital or vice versa. All such reclassifications need executive approval and are subject to overall budgetary limits. The approved reclassifications are shown in the tables accompanying this statement. 
Once all of these issues were taken into account, the executive th had 35.8 million resource Dell and 5.3 million capital Dell available to allocate. Before turning to the mainstream allocations, there are a number of other important issues I'd like to highlight to members, starting with ring-fenced financial transactions capital. In 2019-20, some 244.9 million of ring-fenced financial transactions capital was available, including access to unspent funding from 2018-19 of 52.5 million. The 2019-20 budget announced in February allocated 140.5 million. However, reduced requirements have been declared. 38.8 million was declared previously, and as detailed in the supporting tables to this statement, a further reduced requirement of 63.5 million in relation to higher education loans has been returned in this monitoring round. While some small allocations have been made from this ring fence fund, the Executive will finish 2019-20 with 150.8 million of ring fence financial transaction capital Dell unallocated and therefore lost to the Executive. <laughs> Our capacity to identify suitable projects that can spend all of the ring-fenced financial transactions capital available to us remains an area of concern. I have asked all ministerial colleagues to actively seek opportunities within their departments to utilise this funding through loans or equity investments in the private sector. I intend to address urgently the uptake of financial transactions capital. I will now detail the allocations of the 35.8 million resource Dell and the 5.3 million capital Dell. Cancorda, many children need additional support to help them learn. I have allocated 10 million for children with special education needs. This will help address the backlog in SEN assessment and diagnosis and cover costs such as transport and educational support. I have allocated a further 19 million for the Education Authority to meet the shortfall in contractual pay costs for teachers and non-teaching staff in 2019-20. Members will be aware of the contaminated blood scandal in the 1970s and 80s, thousands of people with haemophilia, including children, were given blood infected with hepatitis C or HIV. Payments for survivors here are lower than in England, and the new decade new approach document includes a priority to bring about priority and financial support. Today, I am providing the Department of Health with an additional one million to increase financial support for people affected by the contaminated blood scandal. This will help alleviate the financial hardship experienced by many of those affected. The Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry reported on the 20th of January. I have to apologise to colleagues for the misprint. Your statement versions are reading the 20th of June 2017. It was actually the 20th of January. I want to correct that uh, in, in, in my report here today. It is long overdue, but I am glad a way forward has now been found to address the recommendations in that report. I am awarding 0.9 million resource Dell to the Executive Office for preparation costs and taking forward the recommendations of the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry and Victims Payment Service scoping study. This will ensure it is well placed to begin making payments. The Executive Office will receive 0.3 million capital Dell related to the capital costs incurred in taking forward the recommendations of the HIA inquiry. Other allocations are detailed in the tables and include 3 million resource Dell to the Department of the Economy to honour a commitment by the previous executive that further education colleges would have access to year-end underspends in order to help manage the impact of the difference between the financial year and the academic year. 1 million resource Dell to the Department for Infrastructure for the provision of winter services. 0.9 million resource Dell to the Assembly for the increased costs associated with a fully operational Assembly and Executive in place for the last quarter. It also includes budget recovery for member salary costs and administerial salaries restored to their correct level under the provisions of Assembly members' salaries and expenses determination 2016. On Capital Dale, the Department of the Economy will receive one million for minor capital works in FE colleges. Department for Infrastructure will receive 3.8 million Capital Dale, two million for the Belfast Transport Hub flagship project, and 1.8 million for the replacement of the field and unsafe street lighting columns. All funding currently available has now been allocated, and while there remain pressures in departments, it is hoped that these will be manageable throughout the remainder of the year. We will continue to keep financial, the financial position under review in the short time remaining before the end of the financial year. Cancorda, I commend the January monitoring round outcome to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister. I call on uh, Steve Egan, Chairperson of the Committee. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, may I thank the Minister for his statement, and uh, may I also welcome to his appointment. Uh, we look forward to working with the Minister and his department, and that the teething problems we have had so far in the provision of information so far will just prove to be that. 
Indeed, in the spirit and intent of the new decade, new approach, we look forward to working cooperatively with the full openness and transparency that you have indeed expressed that you wish to work for as well. So I would like to ask the Minister, can he set out how, over the past few years, in the absence of the Finance Minister, the initial year-on-year -year budget allocations were arrived at and how in year monitoring has been carried out so far? Thank you. Well, can I thank the Chair of the uh, Finance Committee for his remarks and, and assure him uh, that it is indeed the intention, and I, I, I believe it to be the intention across the Executive, to ensure that we work as collaboratively with the committees that scrutinise the departments as we possibly can. The committees provide a vital role uh, in terms of prevent, providing uh, not only accountability uh, to the departments, but also assisting in policy development and, and advice. Uh, and therefore, I think it's in all of our interests that there's a good collaborative arrangement between uh, the departments and indeed the, the committees that provide that level of scrutiny. Uh, obviously, over the last three years, we had a, a process which was largely carried out internally within the civil service with cover, if you like, legal cover being given at various times by the Secretary of State in terms of approving budgets. And within that, the financial allocations were made in year. Uh, thankfully, we're now, uh, all, albeit with a, in, in monitoring round terms, a relatively small allocation at the end of the year. And I think that is uh, perhaps indicative of the fact that of two things. One, that there is less money in the system. Uh, and, and also that departments are spending it better, uh, which is, is uh, something uh, to be welcomed. Uh, but certainly the fact that there's less money in the system means that the allocation at this time is, pro is probably well reduced. So we now have, thankfully, back to the situation where a monitoring round allocation will be brought uh, to the Assembly for comments. It will be brought to the, the Finance Committee uh, for their scrutiny as well. And, and I think uh, I'm certain that most people will welcome the fact that this is the pattern for going on. I call on Paul Frew. Speaker, uh, can I also thank the Minister for his statement and to also congratulate him in the post of Finance Minister. Uh, and I too uh, give him this commitment. We'll work constructively together in order to make lives better for the people of Northern Ireland. Can the Minister explain in detail the reasons why the Executive has $150.8 million of ring-fenced financial transactions, capital, Dell, unallocated, and therefore lost to the executive, and then by extension, the people of Northern Ireland? And can the minister explain if this amount has anything to do with his party colleague, the previous finance minister, walking out on his job without firstly putting in place a working budget? Well, I thank the, the member for his, uh, his kind words. <laughs> Not surprised that he moves quickly on to business uh, beyond that, but uh, that's what I expect from him, knowing him in the chamber over the last number of years. Uh, the, the, I have to say that I agree with the concerns expressed in relation to uh, financial transaction capital. Uh, Any time that this executive will uh, end up giving money back to Treasury, I think, is a matter that all of us should be concerned about because we have limited enough finances as it is, and we want to ensure that we, we spend and get the maximum benefit from every, uh, every pound that this executive has to spend. So this idea of 150 plus million going back to the Treasury is something which concerns me. It obviously has arisen at the end of this financial year. We're only getting uh, a sense of how that is, where it came from. Uh, financial transaction capital is very limited in terms of it's not like the other monies in the system that can be more readily reallocated, so it's very restricted in terms of how it can be spent. But nonetheless, it isn't acceptable the fact uh, that we have uh, this amount that, that ends up getting returned. I don't believe it was the responsibility of my, my predecessor, uh, Martin O'Muller, but what I want to do, uh, and, and I, would, I would welcome work with the committee on this, and particularly with other departments, and I've asked and will be asking executive colleagues to ensure in their departments that this type of uh, resource is, is spent to its fullest extent and we, get, uh, we, we will work, I think, we've asked not only that but the Strategic Investment Board to work with departments as well to make sure that we don't end up in a situation at the end of the year giving this type of money back uh, and I hope that we will see some significant improvement uh, when we come to the end of the financial year next year. Call Melissa McHugh. Uh, just like to uh, again um, congratulate our minister on his new post as well. Um, 
It's always a welcome opportunity when there's additional funds uh, for reallocation, irrespective of what source it is that it comes from. But uh, in particular, uh, I would like maybe if the Minister could give us a, an update on one of our flagship pro projects, that is the A5. The A5 in itself in the area in which I live uh, is so important to us in many ways for the opening up of the northwest region and helping us to reach our full potential. Only but in recent weeks I also have realised just the importance of the A5, that is an attempt to make my way home to the uh, outer regions of West Tyrone and Castle Derg and how difficult it is driving down that road each and every evening that's where your heart's in your mouth and I look forward to the development of that particular project. Again, Gorham Haggard is a member for his kind words. The, the, he is correct, of course, the uh, F5 was mentioned in the New Decade New Approach uh, document. It is a, an executive flagship project. Uh, it's, it's disappointing because I, I was previously involved in, in, a, in a previous ministry that I was responsible for that it's still uh, going on at this stage. But the, uh, the agreement is, as I said, is a flagship project. They, I'm sure the infrastructure minister would be best placed to give you an update on the timetable for construction. Uh, but I, I think that the, we're aware that the, the, the issues which caused the delay in that scheme weren't necessarily due to funding. It was due to, to other matters uh, which held it up. Uh, but there is a commitment to it from the Irish government, specifically reconfirmed it commitment, its commitment to deliver on the £75 million of funding up to 2022. Uh, and certainly, as I say, it is uh, an executive flagship project, but I would imagine on the actual detail in terms of timescale, the infrastructure manager could give you more uh, uh, information in relation to that. I call Colin McGrath. Much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I join with other members in uh, congratulating the Minister on his new appointment and uh, wish him well in his role. Um, I notice uh, the um, welcome, the inclusion of additional finances for the Executive Office for Historical Institutional Abuse Victims, and I'm sure many will agree with me that they are among those who we should be prioritising our efforts. Um, will this investment allow for a, an indicative time frame of when these payments can be made available to those victims? Well, as, uh, again, thank the member for his comments. The, uh, implement the legislation on the historical institutional abuse is estimated to cost between £25 and £60 million in 2021. Uh, work is currently ongoing with organisations connected to, and to the abuse to discuss how they might share these costs with the public sector. The scheme is set to have a sizable long-term financial impact, but the exact amounts will be hard to predict accurately until it begins to operate. And the Executive Office, as he, as he has alluded to and understands, are taking forward the refinement of the cost estimate. So they essentially will be responsible for timetabling. What we're trying to do is enable that and facilitate that by providing some additional resource to them. Uh, and I would hope that perhaps when the First and Deputy First Minister are up uh, answering questions, that they will be able to give some more detail in terms of time frame. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome the restoration of the Monitor Round facility uh, and thank our civil service for the work they did in the absence of this financial instrument. Uh, I welcome the £10 million to help address severe pressure on special educational needs provision, but can I ask the Minister why the Department of Education has been allocated only £19.1 million of the £34.8 million which it bid for teacher pay? Uh, the implication of this funding gap and when the executive will allocate adequate funding to settle teacher industrial action. Uh, I thank the member for his, his comments uh, and, and I agree with him in terms of the gratitude for people who kept this work going over the last three years. Uh, I've made that, uh, similar remarks to the staff in the Department of Finance as well. This, the £19 million that we have uh, allocated as part of this monitoring round is to meet contractual pay costs for teachers and other non-teaching staff in 2019-20. It is not sufficient to settle the industrial dispute over pay awards for 2017-18 or 2018-19, so it is not intended to do that. It is really uh, uh, an issue uh, in terms of contractual costs that, that already exist and try and address those. That obviously will have to be a further discussion when we go to set the budget. Uh, next month in relation to the outstanding pay issues. Uh, and I know that as part of the new decade, new approach, uh, there were commitments given in there on behalf of the two governments to resolving these issues. We also have commitments that we require to give to civil servants because they have pay, uh, pay issues as well. Uh, and so that's why my focus in the last two weeks has been trying to ensure that the governments live up to the commitments that were part of that document. And I hope that we are in position 
to, to feed that into the budget discussions we have and so we can have a fair pay for all of our public servants. Michelle McElveen. Um, this evening. And while we all appreciate the challenges of the limited amount of money available in this monitoring round and obviously the competing priorities of all members, um, we are all aware of the deterioration of the roads network and it's disappointing that the roads maintenance bid was unsuccessful in its totality. And while I welcome the allocation to winter service and street lighting, this does not go far enough to, to cover either of these services. Can the Minister give a commitment in the forthcoming budget to prioritise resources in these areas? Uh, well, I, I accept what the member says, and, and obviously there's a very limited amount of money to give out. I'm trying to spread that uh, as best we can. We've been fortunate thus far, although it was snowing at home where I was leaving this morning, but we've been very fortunate uh, thus far that the winter hasn't been uh, so bad. So we have allocated some money, as you say, I, want, well, I think it's a million pound to, for winter pressures. The Infrastructure Minister uh, obviously would have liked more, and as she has written to me, I have written back to say that if uh, a situation arises between now and the end of the winter, that we will try and find more resources to allocate if, if uh, those are necessary ahead of that. And of course, going forward into the budget scenario, uh, there, there is going to be huge demand uh, and across all of our areas of spend, including uh, roads, and particularly those of us who live in rural areas uh, know all too well uh, the, 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 the troubles that we have in terms of journeys uh, and, and relation to small rural roads. Uh, and, and so the we will certainly try and work with the infrastructure minister to try and secure as much as we can, but we'll be against a list of, of hugely competing demands. And that's why my focus uh, early on in my tenure in this department has been to try and secure the necessary finances for across the executive. So when it comes to these issues, we're talking about what we can allocate rather than what we have to save. I call Gemma Dolan. And I thank the Minister for his statement. And I welcome the allocation of funds to the Department for the Economy for minor capital works in further education in colleges. FE colleges, such as South West College in my constituency of Fermanagh and South Throne, make such a vital and valuable contribution to our communities. And therefore, I was wondering if the Minister could indicate how soon the Department for Economy is likely to receive this funding. Or my other. Well, the Department of the Economy wants the Assembly, as a, uh, uh, the Executive has approved this, and it's, it's gone through to, to this proceeding in the Assembly, then the money immediately becomes available to the departments to spend. Uh, and and the, the member is quite right. I mean, the, the, those colleges play a hugely uh, vital role in terms of uh, overall education, but also in terms of the economy and training young people up to have the necessary skills uh, to match the requirements that the economy has. So we're allocations can be made to them, we certainly will try and do that, uh, but they will, the Department of Economy should have the money very quickly and allocated. There is, as you will understand, uh, 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 an urgency in terms of spending this. This money is to be spent before the end of the financial year, before the end of March, so we get the, the allocations to the departments very quickly and we hope that they get those to the necessary uh, recipients as quickly as they can and get the money spent. I call Paul Given. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I note the Department of Justice um, was able to hand back um, around £3 million, which I'm sure will be uh, well spent now in these reallocations of it. So, having said that, um, can I ask the Finance Minister, was there a bid put forward from the Department of Health to uh, put money into tackling the waiting lists, given that the pressures exist in that? Um, I, I note that I don't see any bid that was made for that. There may be a justifiable reason for that. However, given the uh, levels of people waiting on those lists of over 300,000, um, I would like some reassurance that that is an issue that will be tackled um, by that department and the executive. And then finally, can the finance minister elaborate, Mr. Speaker, on the £19 million operating deficit that was run by TransLink that they made a bid for? Uh, well, firstly, can I say the, the, this is a very limited allocation of, of resources to be spent within a very limited time frame. The, one of the first ministers in fairness to him that I met and that asked to meet me was the health minister, uh, and we had to sit down within two days of the executive being formed to discuss the, the real pressures that are faced in the health department. And as you understand and know, health is a, a, a priority for the entire executive, and we've made that very clear. Uh, and we had a discussion last week when the executive got together. Uh, and reiterated that, uh, that, that. So 
while there may not be an, a, a, a request for an allocation as part of this limited pot, uh, there is absolutely no doubt that, I, from my perspective, that the Health Minister and the Executive as a whole are determined to try and deal with the issue of waiting lists and the, the, the broader pressures felt in the health service. The first priority of the Executive was to meet the pay demand uh, in relation to the, medic, uh, the health staff, uh, and we, we managed to do that. So uh, I wouldn't read anything into the fact that there is no allocation in this for, for waiting lists. There is an Executive uh, priority in relation to all of those pressures, which, which Will be, will be met. The, uh, I haven't got the detail in terms of why TransLink uh, were asking for that increase, uh, but I, I'm happy to provide it to the member uh, at a later date. I call Karen Mullen. I'd like to congratulate the Minister on his new role and uh, also welcome today's statement, particularly the commitment made in relation to special education needs. The number of children with special education needs is increasing year on year, placing an already under-resourced budget at crisis point. It is estimated that in order to stand still, 110 million is required for special education needs provision over the next four years. Can the Minister outline whether there are any, are any plans in place to engage with the British Government on this issue? and to ensure that they provide sustainable funding for future educa special education needs provision? Uh, well, I can assure the member that, that the focus of myself and the department over the last couple of weeks has been to, uh, to do just that, and not specifically in relation to special education needs. And I understand that this allocation makes a limited contribution, uh, albeit I'm sure a very welcome contribution for people who are in that field. Uh, to try and address some of those issues, to try and address the issue of the backlog uh, in assessments and to, to uh, provide some other support there. Uh, and, I mean, the case is very well made for, for children who require that level of support. Uh, but certainly, uh, in terms of the entire executive, there was, uh, and the entire assembly, and perhaps even the entire population here, there was certainly a, a, a great expectation as to what was going to be made available. Uh, for us to deal with the issue of nine years of austerity, of, of uh, the impact that that has had on our finances, on our ability to provide public services to those most in need. Uh, and the focus of my, myself and my own department over the last couple of weeks has been to make sure that we can get the government to live up to those commitments. And if we can get that, and I sincerely hope we can, and we did have a, a, a very productive discussion last week with the Treasury, uh, then I would hope that we are in a position to be able to allocate more resources to these very, very necessary uh, services and frontline services, particularly those which deal with the most vulnerable people in our society. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, uh, for your statement. Um, others have referred to the uh, Department of Infrastructure and the requirements needed. And we know in recent years, Minister, that there has been significant shortfall in overall funding. And uh, I, I wonder, Minister, in terms of uh, any risk assessment, uh, uh, in terms of reductions around road safety, uh, around uh, road gridding, and indeed the street lighting situation, you know. Ha uh, how does that feed into the deliberations in terms of the allocation of funding? And Minister, I don't know whether you want to take this opportunity to let us know how you got on with the Treasury last week and you were able to squeeze any money out of them or not? Uh, well, can I say in relation to the, the, the allocation, I mean, I, I entirely agree with the member that, you know, that, 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 that across all services and, uh, you know, road service and, and the Department of Infrastructure services generally, uh, have suffered the same as everyone else. If we have nine years of austerity budgets, that you know you, you cut, cut, cut until you're back to the bone. And with a whole range of services, we are literally back to the bone. And that's why it's so important uh, that we secure additional finances. So the Department of Infrastructure will have made its bid, as a whole range of other departments did, uh, and made its case. And, and I understand uh, and, and I quite readily accept that the Infrastructure Minister isn't entirely happy with the limitation in terms of the allocation. And I have assured her by writing to her to say if, if, if there are pressures arise as a consequence of, of the, the winter months over the next couple of months, then that we will try and find additional resources for her in that matter. So I hope that provides some reassurance. But in the longer term, you're quite right, we do need sufficient uh, resources across all departments to ensure that we can provide public services, including those which have a direct impact on people's safety as they travel around roads. And yes, we had a productive meeting with the Treasury, but I'm long enough for this game to know uh, that one swallow doesn't make a summer. Uh, so we intend to do the work that the executive uh, tasks us to do, and that involves departments actually collaborating with us and bringing forward uh, very uh, 
tightly costed the, the propositions that were made in the new decade, new agreement document, and that we get that work together and we go and talk to Treasury then about what uh, allocations we, we believe that we should be entitled to as a, as a consequence of that. Uh, and so there's more work to be done, uh, but it was the opening discussion and it was productive, uh, and we, we'll take it from there. I hope it is productive because it's not just about getting money to this institution and the executive, this is about getting money out onto frontline services to things that do have a direct impact on people's safety as they travel around the roads and waiting lists and a whole range of other issues which are huge pressures. I call Meg Nesbitt. Uh, I thank the Minister for his statement and, and wish him well in his tenure as Finance Minister. Uh, Mr Frew has already pointed out £150.8 million uh, is to be lost to the Treasury in unallocated financial transaction capital. Um, Minister, uh, given the LC University's new Belfast campus is running at a projected £100 million pound overspend, is there a potential match there? <laughs> I'm sure it's not the only one that you could match the figure against. The question is, can you match the allocation? Uh, and the financial transaction capital is very restricted in terms of how it can be reallocated. Uh, and it's not satisfactory that, uh, that so much of it has not been able to be spent. And as I say, we have asked the officials to work with all of my, from my department, work with all of the departments and with the Strategic Investment Board to improve uh, that when this is allocated to departments, they actually ensure that they get it spent. The, the project you mentioned is a hugely important one, I think, for the whole executive. Uh, it, it, do, it may neatly in terms of the sum fit this, but in terms of being able to allocate that money across, I'm certain that if we could have done that directly into uh, direct capital funding, we, could have, we would have done that, but it's not. It's restricted in terms of how it can be spent and reallocated. Uh, but nonetheless, the University of Ulster is a hugely important project, and I'm sure that when we come to setting the budget in the next month or two that there will be many arguments around priorities in that regard, and it will be one of the, the issues that will be considered then. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Minister. Um, <clears throat> firstly, can I thank you for making good on the commitment to the additional funding for the victims of contaminated blood. I know that any of us that have spoken to those victims will know what this will mean to them today and the life-changing impact the worst scandal in the history of the NHS had on them, so I, I welcome that. But could I draw the Minister's attention to the Department for Infrastructure and the £1.8 for the replacement of failed and on-street uh, and unsafe street lighting columns. Minister, could you clarify, is this just for unsafe on uh, lighting columns as opposed to fixing the 8,000 plus street lights that have left many of our uh, parts of our province in darkness? Well, uh, firstly, can I, uh, I thank him for his words in relation to the contaminated blood issue, and I know he was one of the MLAs who did come to me directly to raise that issue, so I'm glad that we have been able to make some contribution to try and ease uh, the pain of, of uh, people who have been caught up in that terrible uh, situation over many, many years. And I know there's an ongoing inquiry in London into that, and I, I expect it to report within perhaps the next 18 months, and then we hope to have uh, some degree of, of across the board for support for all of the people who are affected in relation to that. The, the allocation in this is for the street lighting columns. That's what the Department of Infrastructure have asked for. Uh, so I think if there were a, is there a broader issue, as there generally is, as all, all elected reps know with street lighting, there's always a broader issue that we all deal with on a daily basis. So I, I think that would be a matter you need to take up with the Department of Infrastructure. I call Catherine Kelly. Minister, I also would like to congratulate you on your appointment and welcome your decision to prioritise funding for special educational needs. The number of pupils with edu special educational needs has been rising steadily. Most attend mainstream schools and support is primarily funded from school budgets. Those budgets that have been under considerable pressure for some time. I'm sure your announcement today will be welcomed throughout the sector and recognised as an indication that prioritising the needs for children and putting people first is uppermost in the Minister's approach to allocating funding. Does the Minister agree that investment in the potential of children today is a sound investment in growth and prosperity? Uh, I thank the member for her question. Uh, the, one of the, I suppose, the, the tragedies of, of the, the fact that we've been dealing with uh, reduced budgets is actually demand for services has risen at the same time, so it's almost a double whammy. Uh, so while our, uh, our funding allocations have gone down as a consequence of austerity, and we're told austerity is at an end, and, and let, we'll see what comes of that, uh, but the demand for these services has risen 
uh, significantly. So, of course, there is a priority to get there. Of course, uh, what we're reallocating in this very limited monitoring round makes a contribution to that, but it doesn't go all the way to fixing those problems. Uh, and we would, had we got sufficient resources like to do that, because, as I say, this is not just about an executive spent money. This is about frontline public services to the people who are most in need. And I, I can't think of anybody more in need than children who suffer from special educational needs. I call Trevor Lunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I also welcome Mr. Murphy to his latest post. Uh, there, there's a, a paragraph on page three about the Presbyterian Mutual Society. Uh, this is something I haven't heard much about for quite a few years, but it, it appears to be encouraging in that they've managed to sell another property and refunded eight million pounds against the loan they got from this assembly. Could, could the minister give us some figures here? Or could he furnish us with them, maybe subsequent to this, that? Um, would indicate how much of that loan is still outstanding and what's the approximate value of the properties that the Presbyterian Mutual still owns but hasn't realised in terms of sale? Uh, can I uh, agree with the, the member? Uh, he's long enough here, like myself, to remember this issue coming. And uh, when I saw it popping up in this, uh, I, I had the same questions. Are we still dealing with this issue? Uh, for I think it was maybe at the beginning of the executive in 2007. Uh, that this issue came onto the book. So th this is report in progress, which is welcome. I don't have the figures that he has asked for, but I can assure him I'll get them to him as soon as I can. I call Colin Gildernay. Corey Mahogat, Con Corlea. Um, I too would like to thank the Minister for his statement here today. And having met uh, along with the Deputy Chair of the Health Committee last week, with the, one of the groups that represents the victims of the contaminated blood scandal, I'd like to particularly welcome your uh, ability to find an additional one million for that. Um, I think it's fair to say that the testimony we heard from those people last week was truly harrowing in relation to the extent of the difficulties that have been created for them, both with the lifelong nature of their illness and the severity of it. So could I please ask the Minister, um, when does he expect the additional payments to these people to be increased, when, when that will commence? Well, as I said in relation to a previous answer, the, uh, the, once the, the front and package is agreed here uh, and has been agreed by the executive, then it's immediately allocated to the departments. There's a very limited time left in this financial year in which to spend, so there's an urgency attached to this. Uh, and the, my executive colleague, the Minister of Health, will be making his department's plans public shortly with regards to this funding. So I look forward to that. I call Mr. Mark Dorgan. My regret, I can't call you because I pray his denaira for honey and righteous because Kovar just said I passed new foster. I'm hopeful, uh, Mr. Speaker, that this new mandate sees a new approach uh, to monitoring rounds. It's imperative that we as committee members, if we are to do our jobs properly, do get sight of departmental budgetary positions and indeed uh, bidding <coughs> priorities in advance of monitoring rounds. I know that couldn't be the case this time, but it would be very helpful, not just to committees, but to members, I believe, going forward. In terms of this document, uh, in reduced requirements, I see uh, 0.3 million pounds being uh, handed back, if you like, uh, for a foil suicide project. Now, I'm not exactly sure how that came about. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the minister here isn't either. But given the very welcome pledges from the new executive last week on mental health and suicide provision, could I be so bold as to ask the minister for a commitment to consider favourably any future bids regarding this project? Uh, well, uh, we thank, again, thank the member for his, his comments, uh, and he's correct. Uh, there, obviously, we were two weeks into this, and the monitoring round had to be brought forward. There's an urgency to get that approved, to get the money spent, uh, so you don't have the time that you would normally uh, like to have in relation to that. And I, I, I had a conversation earlier with the chair and the deputy chair of the finance committee to assure them that you know, in, in future we are looking to try and get maximum input. Uh, and maximum transparency in relation to all of these matters. So collaboration and cooperation with the committees and, and MLAs generally in these matters uh, will be important. And there is a real intent uh, f uh, 
there was a discussion, as I say, last week with executive colleagues, and there is a real attempt to try and make this uh, as workable as we possibly can right across the board, which I welcome. Uh, clearly, mental health is a key priority. Uh, I'm not sure, as he, as he anticipated, why the specific reason why that project, uh, there is reduced requirement there, and I can certainly try and get him uh, some answers in relation to that, and I'll write to him. Uh, later on in relation to that. This is about re reallocating, as I had said, a relatively small amount of money to spend relatively quickly. There is a, a, a strong sense of priority right across the executive, and again featured in our, in our discussion last week in relation to mental health in general, uh, to try and to improve services and to try and make a real impact in terms of this uh, issue, which is becoming uh, of increasing importance across society. So I, I can't say for certain, I'm sure he would like me to do it, about the commitment to that specific project, but certainly it fits in in the overall ambit of the mental health uh, services, and there is a commitment across the executive to try and support them and to allocate as much resources as we possibly can to them in the time ahead. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, can I wish you well in office also? After a wait of 15 years, the new bill for Devonish College has eventually started. However, I notice in your internal reallocation that there has been a removal of two million from that budget already. Can you please advise as to why that has happened? Again, I apologise. I'm not sure the specifics of that, uh, why that is the case. Uh, but you, you, you find it come towards the end of the financial year, perhaps you know, contracts haven't been awarded as quickly as they can. There, there may be other reasons for delaying. Uh, particularly capital projects can run into uh, unforeseen snags. And, and unless people are certain, the last thing we want is that if, if a project or if a department is not certain they're going to spend the money by the end of the financial year, they should surrender it for reallocation. You know, there will be future money for those projects if they're committed to. Uh, so they should really, rather than hang on to it and find that they can't spend it, that money goes back to the Treasury. That's the worst outcome that we can have. So I don't know the specifics. Again, I'll ask officials to make a note of that, and, and I'll, I'll write to you in relation to that project. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I too thank the Minister for his statement tonight. Just with regard to the reduced requirements uh, with, on the Department of Communities, and they've declared that £19 million for welfare reform mitigations and housing benefits in total. Um, I know, uh, also note that many people uh, have been successful in their appeals leading to mitigations being refunded, calling into the question the entire welfare system as it is. I would like to ask the Minister what the rest of this is relating to, as well as the significant budget going back from housing benefit, given the cliff edge that we're facing in March, and if the Minister has any plans for future funding of welfare mitigations past this financial year. Uh, could, could I thank the member for question and could I welcome her to the chamber? I haven't had an opportunity to uh, welcome her to her post as yet, so I hope she, uh, she has a successful time here. Uh, I, her predecessor was a person with, with plenty of questions <laughs> in, in terms of that, so I, I presume she'll take up where he left off, uh, but I, I very much welcome her here. There has been, as, as, the, uh, as I said in the statement in relation to welfare mitigation, uh, the, the case is that it's not that the, the lack of uptake, but it is the case that uh, people have had their appeals uh, been successful, which does, I, I accept the point you make, does prove the nonsense of some of these so-called reforms, uh, where they're trying to drive people unfairly out of benefits which they're entitled to. So I'm glad that the appeals have been successful, but nonetheless we want to ensure, uh, and I know my colleague here beside me uh, has been making announcements in relation to uh, securing that mitigation package going forward, because it has been uh, the, the biggest safety net that has been provided to people, uh, vulnerable people, uh, anywhere in these islands. Uh, so I think it is something that this uh, Assembly and Executive can be proud of, even though we, we still disagree with the, the thrust uh, of the welfare reform proposals that have come from London. Uh, in relation to the, the Housing Executive, again, I don't have the detail as to where that has come from, uh, but I, I will, of course, get some detail on that and, and, and write to the member. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Could I ask the Minister to bring some clarity to the issue of EU exit costs? In his statement at page 2, he says $37.5 million was previously allocated to prepare for a no-deal exit. This funding was mainly provided as resource Dell. The outcome is an easement in resource Dell of $16.1 million. Then at page 3, he said reduced requirements totaling some 4.3 million 
have been declared by a number of departments in relation to the 37.5 million EU exit preparation funding provided. And then back in page two, he concludes the that consequently the additional 2.4 million resource deal has been made available for reallocation. Could he square those figures? Well, I, I'm sure I can, although I may not have time to do it within the, the context of the statement. But I just say briefly that the, the £37 million of, of the 4.3 reduced requirements, DERA surrendered £2.9 million, Department of Justice surrendered £0.6 million, Department of the Economy £0.2 million, and the, the Executive Office £0.4 million. Uh, the allocations are uh, to DERA for £4.9 million for trade inspection, legislation, policy staffing. Two million uh, to Department for Economy for Invest NI, two point two million to NI Water for maximising chemical stock levels, ten point six million for, for roads, ports and infrastructure, three million for vehicle parts, uh, Department of Health, two point seven million for medicines, Department of Justice, three point one million for policing. Uh, so there are a range of expenditure. What we have is obviously there was money allocated as a barn consequential for an O deal exit. Now thankfully we didn't have an O deal exit, so I think it's very welcome the fact that the executive and the departments were able to hold on to that money and reallocate it. If there's a specific requirement in relation to some of the figures, I would be very happy if the member would drop me a letter and I'll respond to them in due course. I will call Jerry Carroll. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And while people no doubt welcome the news that some worthy causes have been addressed in this announcement, um, I want to ask a question on behalf of civil service workers who will be confused, Mr. Speaker, because whilst they have been fighting hard on picket lines for the pay they deserve, indeed the route uh, last Friday, Friday passed, they have been told by the Department for Finance that the money was not there for them. Yet here is a statement from the Finance Minister which tells of excess millions from the storm of coffers for reallocation. Um, they, will be, uh, they will be confused too, no doubt, when a brand new deal was signed up to which did not mention their pay struggle and which seemingly secured absolutely no financial commitments from the British Government. Can the Minister clarify for those workers whether their pay dispute will be resolved to meet their demands as a matter of urgency? Well, the member should know, uh, if he's following this, that the negotiations are ongoing with the, uh, with the NIPSA in relation that I met them last week. Uh, and so it's, it, it wouldn't be possible to make an allocation as part of this, where money has to be allocated now and spent before the end of the financial year to have that as part of the negotiations. What we're trying to negotiate is the issues that arose from previous pay issues and, and also to negotiate uh, the pay terms and conditions going forward uh, for NIPSA. So that's part of the discussion. Those uh, negotiations have begun in earnest this week. This money has been allocated in the middle of all of that, and it wouldn't have been possible to allocate that across to it. And what we want to do is get a financial settlement for this year so we can address the issues which have caused industrial action and to get some certainty and security for the coming years so that people uh, are being awarded a fair pay for the work that they do. And that, that has been my commitment to the civil servants and to, to the people in NIPSA uh, going forward. So that's, that's our desire. Uh, there is a commitment uh, to try and do that, and I have uh, officials negotiating with NIPSA, as I say, I met them myself last week. In relation to the, the new deal, or the new decade, new agreement document, it, this, that's the two governments drafted that document. Uh, there were a range of issues mentioned in it, and I made sure, I, I assured the people that I met from NIPSA the fact that they weren't mentioned in terms of a pay settlement. From our perspectives, we didn't draft it and none of the political parties here drafted, didn't indicate any lack of desire to try and resolve the issues that civil servants are facing. Uh, the, the government's put down the priority in relation to the health workers' pay. The teachers' uh, pay was mentioned as well. But there is a desire to try and ensure that civil servants, and we're, all of us are aware that they've been in industrial action now for some period of time, and that will continue, and that's their right, uh, until such times as they're satisfied with whatever the outcome that the negotiations may be. So it's not... The, the, the lack of inclusion in this is nothing to do with the fact that those negotiations want to come to a successful collusion. conclusion. You couldn't allocate money in this round while we're actually in the middle of negotiations because you haven't come to an agreement as to what the allocation actually would be. Uh, so my priority is to try and secure sufficient resources to ensure that civil servants and all public sector workers uh, get a fair pay for the work that they do uh, and the contribution that they make to society. Can I call Claire Sugden? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I wish to pick up on a point uh, made by both Mr. Nesbitt and Mr. Frew in relation to financial transactions capital. Um, my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that FTC is a loan from uh, Treasury going to private sector uh, entities via a sponsoring department. And there is opportunity for that sponsoring department to add an interest rate, which indeed that department can make use of in terms of resource. I suppose it is disappointing that we are sending back £150 million pounds and indeed interest, which perhaps is revenue for this uh, executive and is much needed. Um, I would be interested to hear the Minister's thoughts around this as a potential uh, uh, revenue raising uh, mechanism, indeed if it's considerable at all to, to make a dent in our finances. Well, I, I, I agree with her in terms of the concern in relation to this, and I think it should be a matter of concern for us all. I'm not certain that it is a significant revenue raising uh, option for us, but nonetheless, if there is uh, our finances allocated here, we want to make sure uh, that the departments are use, using them all and that we, we don't end up surrendering uh, any resources back to Treasury because that's been lost uh, as far as we're concerned. So, as I said, that we, we, the officials will be talking to all of the departments. We will be uh, asking the Strategic Investment Board to work with them as well to make sure that they maximise the use of that, that resource available to them so we don't end up in a situation like this uh, next year again. McCall, Pat Catney. First of all, uh, I wish to apologise to yourself for being late in um, and I uh, wish to apologise to the House for coming in late on that. But look, like an old pro boxer, I thought there was going to be some sort of a bell, and I didn't hear the bell, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, so I was caught out. I wish to uh, congratulate Mr. Murphy on his appointment uh, to the Ministry. And my question is uh, again, I look down and you see the £1 million which was allocated for the contamination blood, but alongside that, I see the £5.2 million for the doctors and for the dentists, which has not come across. And I would like to think that this is going to impact in any way on our a and &E as we have it at the minute. And just one other observation that when I did my own, when we did our own accounts in my own businesses, I was very lucky, Minister, that there was a surplus. And I was wondering, is there a way that within these two years, I mean, I, I note that it's a one-year budget, or one year with this financial, we need to move that. This house needs to, this needs to be moved to to two years, and is there any way that you could find or try to see is there a possibility in doing this? Thank you. Uh, well, thank the member for his question. Generally speaking, if you're a boxer waiting on the bell, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I, uh, in, in relation to, yes, of course, there are bids that aren't met, and, and we have to try and ensure uh, in meeting bids, obviously, there are things like the contaminated blood thing, which is hugely important. Uh, issue to address. And there, you know, any of the health bids and any of the bids from across the departments are, are important issues and departments make the case of them and we try and ensure that the inability to deliver on that at this time doesn't have a uh, very detrimental effect. So, so clearly we don't want to see that, that happen in, in, in relation to health. Uh, in relation to the multi-annual budget, you're correct, that's what we want to get on to. That gives some certainty to departments going forward. Issues like uh, Mr. Carroll mentioned in relation to pay for civil servants, it gives some certainty to people in terms of progression of pay. Uh, if we have multi-annual budgets, and that's the place we want to get to. We're waiting on Treasury to do a spending review. There's likely to be, from our discussion with Treasury, it's not certain yet, but quite possibly a budget in March and then another budget in November and a spending review in between. So all of those things have an impact on how we do business here, and we want to get beyond that into a, a multi-annual budgetary situation. That's a very strong desire, because in that you can give some certainty not only to departments but also to staff as well. That concludes questions on the statement. Could I ask members now to take a raise for two minutes to we change the top table?
Order, members. The next item on the order paper is a legislative consent motion on the direct payments to farmers legislative continuity bill. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That this assembly, noting the urgency of the issue resulting from the absence of legal powers needed to continue making direct payments to NI farmers in the 2020 scheme year, agrees that the provisions in the direct payments to farmers brackets legislative continuity brackets bill as introduced into the House of Commons on the 9th of January 2020 should be considered by the UK Parliament. Thank you. I call the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to move the motion. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy <coughs> Speaker. I beg to move. Thank you. The motion has been moved. The Business Committee has not allocated any specific time limit to this debate, uh, nor to individual contributions. I call upon the Minister to open the debate upon this motion. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I first of all declare an interest as declared in the Register of Interests um, at this moment in time until I totally divest myself of interest in this matter. Uh, normally, I'd have brought this motion forward within the established time frame, and I apologise that that wasn't possible to the House today. Uh, we are under very tight time constraints, and uh, if I wish to have the legislative authority to enable some £293 million to be paid in direct payments to farmers in the 2020 scheme this year. The UK Minister for Finance, or for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs wrote to me last Monday and asked that the Assembly would provide legislative consent to Her Majesty's Government legislating on our behalf in relation to the direct payments to farmers legislative continuity bill. I will provide the House with some background. Article 137 of the Withdrawal Agreement disapplies the EU Direct Payment Regulation, EU Regulation 1307-2013, which provides the legal basis for CAP <coughs> Pillar 1 support to UK farmers, so that it ceases to apply to the UK after the 2019 scheme year. The reason for this is that the 2020 schemes payment would be made out of the EU 2021 financial year budget that falls into the new EU multi-annual financial framework to which the UK is not contributing. Therefore, if nothing was done to replace the EU regulation, there would be no legal basis for direct payment to UK farmers. The Direct Payment Legislative Continuity Bill corrects that deficiency. The bill is a UK government bill. It is a technical bill of narrow scope which incorporates EU direct payments regulations into United Kingdom law. It provides the underpinning of direct support for the 2020 scheme year only. It will also create delegated powers to make subordinate regulations to ensure that this retained legislation operates effectively in a domestic context. The delegated powers in the bill will enable, fa will enable failures or deficiencies in retained EU law to be remedied, and also for retained law to keep pace with any change introduced into corresponding EU law during the 2020 scheme year, if deemed necessary. It is envisaged that the UK Agriculture Bill, which was introduced in Parliament last week, will provide the necessary powers from 2021 onwards, including the ability to keep existing schemes in operation until we have a replacement. I will be bringing forward a further legislative consent motion on the Agricultural Bill in due course. You should wish to note Clause 3 and uh, 4 for Lira to make regulations to move basic payment entitlement values in Northern Ireland towards a uniform unit value, but this is a discretionary power and subject to the affirmative resolution of this House. Agriculture is a devolved matter, but the provisions of this Bill extend to the whole of the UK. Therefore, it contains provisions that fall within the legislative competence of this Assembly. For that reason, DEFRA is seeking legislative consent from this Assembly in order to legislate on behalf of Northern Ireland. As I said a few minutes ago, I received a formal request from DEFRA Minister Eustace last Monday night. So this is happening at a pace. The bill was introduced to Parliament on the 9th of January. It is scheduled to complete its remaining common stages tomorrow, 28th of January, 
and the Lord stages on the 29th of January, so that it will become law by the 31st of January or a withdrawal date. Because this bill is likely to be certified as a money bill, the last stage in which amendments can be considered as it completes its common stages is the 20th of January. Therefore, the legislative consent from the Northern Ireland Assembly needs to provide it no later than today. Without consent, the bill may no longer extend to Northern Ireland, leaving us with no legislative power uh, to provide for direct payments in 2020 scheme year after the 31st of January. This timetable was only confirmed to my officials last Tuesday morning. I have taken all necessary steps to ensure this Assembly is given the opportunity to consider as quickly as possible. My officials briefed the ERA committee on Tuesday last week, and I am grateful to the committee for facilitating this briefing at short notice. It is crucial <coughs> that there is no gap between the ending of the EU legislative basis for direct support to farmers in Northern Ireland this Friday uh, and its replacement with domestic legislation. The Assembly will be fully aware of the importance of this support to the farming industry. The Scottish and the Welsh governments are also moving with speed through the necessary processes to ensure that legislative consent for the other two devolved institutions is also in place. Both devolved institutions have now given their consent to the Scottish Parliament on the 16th of January and the Welsh Assembly on the 22nd of January. I should also inform the House that DERA intends to lay the two statutory instruments 